Uh, thank you. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Stefan Zivelt from Switzerland. He is one of the European experts, not only in uh, endoscopic treatment of uh, early uh, GI cancer by EMR or ESD, but also in other up-to-date endoscopic areas, such as pancreatic biliary endoscopy, US, and POEM. He's also a um, member of editorial board of gastrointestinal endoscopy. And it's my great pleasure to introduce his lecture, ESD update in Europe. And uh, he's, he, he, uh, he will uh, uh, talk us about ESD in Switzerland. Please. Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much, Sergei, for the nice introduction. I would also like to share our experience with uh, ESD here in Switzerland. We are a small country, only 8.57 million inhabitants, I think uh, smaller than Tokyo. And uh, from my knowledge, um, in Switzerland, um, there are about seven centers dealing with endoscopic submucosal dissection. Since 2008, in our center, we have performed 320 cases, but I have to mention, the story with ESD didn't start in Zurich for me. It started uh, already in Hamburg. This is a very historical picture from a day in July in 2008 in Hamburg, still with my old boss, Professor Sohendra. And at that day, Dr. Takuchi Kotoda came with his team from the National Cancer Institute in Tokyo to Hamburg to teach us personally ESD. And it was a very short trip for um, Dr. Gotoda, only 1.5 days. So he arrived the Friday in the morning, 7.30. We had prepared six ESDs in 16 hours. We performed these ESDs and we finished at 0.20. Then we had quick dinner and the sightseeing had to be postponed and reduced to only some hours before the departure to back to Tokyo the next day. So... This friendship and network continued, and in the following years, um, we had many friends who came to Zurich to personally teach us, especially Professor Yahagi or Professor Inoue, and this was for us the most important step forward to introduce this difficult technique. And I always think here of this uh, sentence, of the slogan at the entrance of the San Diego baseball stadium, uh, because uh, Takuchi is a big baseball fan and there is written there is no shortcut to true success and I think this fits quite well for learning ESD. When we look now at our 320 cases from the distribution... Stefan? Yes? Uh, yes? Your slides are not seen. I think you are not passing the slides, I think. Sorry. Uh, wait a moment. It's the first slide, yeah. Can you see now? Yes. Yes, now it's good. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so when we look at our data now, we have most of the cases in the esophagus. Um, stomach is not so much, but increasing. And with regard to colorectal, we have most cases performed in the rectum. And um, I would like to start in the esophagus. Um, so our approach in the esophagus is that all patients uh, undergo general anesthesia. And uh, at the moment, we are using the TTJ knife for the procedures in the upper GI tract. I think the knife is not so important, but I think what is very important is to use the multi-point tracking device or other tracking devices as soon as possible for the procedure, because the use of these uh, tracking devices really helped us to make the procedure more safe and to re reduce also the time of the procedure. I would like to show you this video here. This is a patient with an early esophageal cancer. Um, this patient was um, investigated with a new X1 uh, Olympus um, technology. You see here nicely these early malignant changes. Unfortunately, the changes are almost circumferentially. What we can say, it is a mucosal cancer. It looks like mucosal cancer, so there is an indication for endoscopic resection. However, because of the circumferential extent, 
we had to perform a circumferential ESD. So we first did the round cutting in the um, distal and then in the proximal area. And here you see how we use the um, TTJ knife. And immediately after uh, finalizing the round cut, we used this lifting device, which showed us um, Professor Haru Inui. So a very soft snare with the help of the clip is introduced um, outside the endoscope. And then this snare is fixed with a clip in the area of the lesion. And um, in this technique, um, there is not only one point where this snare is fixed. We fix the snare at several points. And uh, here you see um, the second clip, which is uh, introduced and uh, the snare is fixed. It is important that um, the clip should only touch the mucosa and the superficial submucosa. You should avoid to clip the muscle layer. And um, because this is here a, a circumferential lesion, we fix this um, snare at the whole area of this uh, circumferential incision. This clip here at uh, nine o'clock and then finally um, another clip will be placed at 12 o'clock. This is the last one now. And then you can pull on this snare in order to lift, but because this is a circumferential lesion, what you can do is also now that you close the snare and this has another positive effect for the lifting. So we are closing the snare now, we pull on the snare and now we have much more better conditions in order to continue here with the submucosal injection and with um, the dissection of the submucosal fibers. So since we have introduced this technique, uh, we are feeling more safe, um, in, especially in the esophagus, and we can also tremendously uh, reduce the um, procedure time. Here um, we are finishing this uh, circumferential um, resection. And um, here you see the specimen, and in this case, um, the patient had already a superficial submucosal invasion. However, it was a R0 resection. This patient had a lot of comorbidities. That's why our surgeons were not too keen to operate on him. So the decision of the GI tumor board was to perform a close follow-up in this patient. And um, this is also quite interesting because we performed a circumferential ESD. We treated the patient with budeno 5 syrup and also cortisone, and this is the follow-up after six months. The patient did not develop a relevant uh, stricture. When <clears throat> we look at our data on early squamous cell cancer, um, it is quite interesting that even we think it is still a mucosal cancer, in many cases, in more than 50% of the cases, we have already submucosal cancer, and in one-fourth of the patients, there's already a lymphovascular invasion. And um, even of this submucosal invasion, about, in about 70% of the cases, we could reach an R0 resection. However, um, we could only call the endoscopic treatment as curative in 41% of um, the cases. So that shows that after the endoscopic resection, um, especially in patients with a squamous cell cancer, we have sometimes very difficult clinical decision-making because we have an R0 resection. However, we have already submucosal invasion. We have comorbidities. And I think it is very necessary to collect these patients with early squamous cell cancer because um, it is very important to know if a patient got the radiation or if he didn't get any radiation, if he was only follow-up, how the follow-up of this patient is because there is a huge demand for clinical decision-making in these patients. Another point <clears throat> what we um, see is um, that um, we get more and more complex cases with uh, early squamous cell cancer. In about 10%, we have uh, a circumferential extent. And uh, in my video, uh, we could show you a successful management of the patient, but this is not always the case. We also have patients with 
stenosis where we had to perform a lot of dilatations. What we are doing in this patient now is that when the lesion is mucosal and there is a chance for a curative treatment by ESD, we prophylactically place a PEG in this patient where we had to perform uh, a circumferential ESD. And after the procedure, we have a protocol where the patient gets budinophile syrup twice a day. And we also um, apply a prednisolone, 50 milligram for three days. Later, we go down to 20 milligram. And we continue this prednisolone treatment as long as the wound is not completely healed. This can uh, be several months. That's why we also perform a pneumocystis prophylaxis with Bactrim four to three times per week. Another group of patients which come more and more are patients with recurrent early cancer after definitive radiochemotherapy. And um, we have already data from the Japan that um, it is also feasible to use ESD in these patients. So far, we were a little bit afraid to perform um, ESD in such um, patients with this history. Here you see a case patient after definitive radiotherapy, he developed again a, a superficial um, early cancer in the esophagus. And here in this patient, we um, try out um, also endocytoscopy um, to evaluate the clinical value of this technique. So here you can see nicely on the right side, you have the regular esophageal tissue and on the left side, you have the cancerous tissue where you see the enlarged nuclei and in the middle here, you nicely see um, the border of this um, lesion. So in this case, <clears throat> we also uh, performed ESD and um, I only want to show you again how important this lifting is because even in these complicated cases with the severe fibrosis, lifting is really mandatory to perform a safe procedure. And also here in this case, it helped us a lot to uh, dissect the fibrotic uh, submucosal fibers and we could uh, successfully finish uh, the procedure in this patient. The result was finally that also this patient had a superficial submucosal uh, invasion. However, it was a R0 resection. And um, so far, um, after 12 months, um, there is no recurrent cancer in this area. We were happy <clears throat> to be a part of this um, study um, induced by uh, Peter Siersema in the Netherlands. They, also, they started to collect such uh, complex uh, cases. And I think uh, we have several papers from Japan, but this is the first paper in Europe demonstrating that um, salvage endoscopic resection after definitive radiochemotherapy is an option and is also feasible in the Western world. Let me come now to um, Barrett's early cancer. Um, so far um, in Europe, there was a tendency that um, EMR is uh, the optimal and the best treatment for cases with early esophageal Barrett's cancer. And then after the endoscopic resection, um, radiofrequency ablation is um, performed. I have to say, I don't agree with this opinion, maybe five years ago, but what we observe is that we also get more and more complex cases with intramucosal large cancer and also with um, uh, lesions with suspicious cancer, submucosal cancer invasion. And um, when you see a lesion like this or a lesion like this or like this or like this, I think we agree that this is intramucosal cancer. However, when you start to perform an EMR in such a patient, you will completely mess up the chances for a curative resection in such patients. So ESD is also uh, very necessary to perform in complex Barrett's cases. And that's why there is a huge demand to learn ESD in the Western world. <clears throat> when we look at our data with regard to the early Barrett's cancer, um, we have about 300 uh, patients with uh, early malignant changes uh, of Barrett's. And for sure, uh, uh, we are not performing ESD when the patient only has a high-grade dysplasia or a very small um, intramucosal cancer. In these cases, still 
uh, EMR is uh, sufficient and shows good long-term results. These are about 70 to 75 percent of our cases. But we have the complex cases, as I have shown you. These are about 16% uh, of um, the cases. And uh, even um, ESD is sometimes very difficult in, this, uh, in these cases and will take a lot of time. We still can say that we have a curative resection rate of 68% in these complex cases. And um, we were quite happy about the idea of Pradeep Bandari to also um, connect some centers with uh, the same um, approach in these complex Barrett's cases. And I think uh, these results uh, nicely show that in about uh, 65 to 70% of the cases, still a curative resection is possible by using the ESD in the Barrett's. Another problem from my point of view is that we still have not enough data on um, the follow-up of patients with submucosal cancer invasion in the Barrett's. And um, that's why um, I'm very happy um, that uh, Jack Bergman introduced a new prospective international multi-center cohort study where patients after a radical resection with a submucosal Barrett's cancer are included into a study. Patients don't receive adjuvant surgery, but um, they are followed up with a watchful waiting strategy. Every three months, they get um, gastroscopy and EOS and um, once per year, computer tomography. So far, there are 141 patients included. There will be a follow-up over five years. And uh, endpoints of the studies are, study are disease-free specific survival mortality and quality of life. I think this is a very important study, also uh, demonstrating the importance of ESD and also the potential efforts for the patient uh, who have an advanced uh, disease with regard to submucosal invasion. <clears throat> Gastric cancer cases are not so common in our department, but there is also an increasing number of these patients. They are coming mostly from the south of uh, Switzerland. So far, in about 11% uh, of the cases, we had a submucosal uh, invasion. The other cases uh, were almost uh, dysplasias or intramucosal cancers. We could achieve a um, high uh, R0 resection rate in these um, patients. Let me come now, <clears throat> finally, to uh, the colorectal area. And um, here I have to say personally, colorectal ESD is still the most um, difficult uh, procedure for me. And um, we have to um, see this also under the background that um, the endoscopic mucosal resection is still quite effective in a lot of uh, cases in the colorectum. When we <clears throat> analyzed our cases, we have about 1,000 um, endoscopic um, uh, resections in the colorectal area since two, uh, 10 years, and uh, about 90% of the patients we could manage with the EMR, and uh, in 11% of the cases, we performed an endoscopic submucosal um, dissection. And because the colon is still the most difficult, um, we um, have uh, the most of the cases, almost 100 in the rectum. Here <clears throat> in these patients, we um, perform only conscious sedation. We use the technique of Professor Yahagi with a dual J knife. And um, what was also a landmark for us, the introduction of the new hemostasis approach using the BIO3 and especially using low force coagulation in order to perform a vessel sealing. And I think um, this was very important for us because when we have vessels like this, we don't need to switch to the coag grasper. We can nicely uh, coagulate uh, the vessel here with this um, low um, but um, forced coagulation from both sides until the bubbles come up. And this um, saves a lot of um, procedure time and makes the procedure um, more safe and more efficient. <clears throat> when we look at our data um, with, uh, with regard to the histology, um, one third of our patients in the rectum finally had high-grade dysplasia. And uh, in about 20%, we had um, 
uh, cancer uh, invasion. We also had many uh, borderline cases. So um, in the rectum, I think if there is any doubt uh, of a potential cancer, we always try to perform ESD. And um, this also has questions for our setting because um, we get more and more such cases where we definitely have to say you will mess up the procedure if you start here with the EMR. But um, procedure time is a problem. Also, um, the time for the um, endoscopist. Um, I have now my colleague Stefan Groth. We are together dealing with ESD. Sometimes we are also doing a procedure together because for us to remove such a lesion uh, still costs more than three or four hours. So <clears throat> let me conclude. Um, ESD is getting more and more uh, importance as a primary diagnostic endoscopic procedure, also here in Switzerland. Um, for us personally, it is a continuous and never ending learning process. Lifting devices and the new hemostasis approaches significantly uh, reduces the procedure time and were very important for us to improve our technique. And esophagus and rectum ESD are the most important procedures in our clinical setting. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Stefan. Um, uh, I have a question uh, to you. Uh, is D is a relatively uh, new discipline of endoluminal surgery in Western countries. Uh, Professor Ihagi called ESD a low-tech but uh, highly skilled procedure. Uh, what is your op personal opinion on how to establish uh, such kind of highly skilled procedure in Western uh, centers? What is the learning curve and what are your personal tips and tricks for the beginners? I think the first time, uh, the first thing is um, you have to uh, convince also your surgeons because we gastroenterologists, we are uh, working very close to the surgeon. And um, I think there's also a new generation of surgeon who is very open for minimally um, invasive uh, treatment. This is uh, one point to convince your surgeon and to bring the surgeon in the boat. On the other hand, we have to see that uh, the patients nowadays are well informed and um, they also ask for the most minimally invasive procedure. So I think somehow uh, the time is on our side, but um, the learning process is uh, definitely um, tremendous. I think, um, as Mario mentioned, the best is to start in Japan to see how the Japanese endoscopists um, perform the procedure and also what I was always very impressed, these um, meetings of surgeon, pathologists and endoscopists together. I think this is a new culture. We have to introduce this culture. This is not easy in many countries, but I think this is the right way to go. And for sure, um, you need um, also, um, as I know from you, you have established many facilities to train ESD in animal models. I think this is the way um, to, to start, but I think the young generation is very, very interested in the procedure. And um, I think ESD is the future um, for many, many indications because it will save um, patients from um, big surgeries. Can I make a question, uh, Sergey? Yes. Yeah, and it's it's for both of you. How, um, do you have a, the chance to um, offer trainees um, porcin uh, models and and labs to to train? Is, is, are they available in Russia or in Switzerland? And how how often do you use before starting SD or after starting SD, Sergey? Uh, thank you, Mario. Of course, it's uh, it's a very very important uh, uh, point, and in uh, in our center we we have uh, enough uh, facilities for training uh, the young doctors uh, uh, how to perform EMR and ESD. We have uh, animal models, pig stomachs, stomachs and co colons, and we uh, started to train the young doctors, of course, together with uh, the uh, leading uh, Japanese experts. 
uh, more than 10 years ago. And uh, I really appreciate you and Stefan, uh, who paid a lot of attention to train the young generation of Russian doctors. Uh, and I think that now we have enough uh, training centers in Russia equipped with uh, such kind of uh, simulators. <clears throat> so we are not a um, so-called training or university uh, center and here in Switzerland the capacity for animal model training is also limited, but um, the German Society of Endoscopy offers um, training uh, facilities and more and more people from Switzerland also come to the German meetings and uh, profit also from these possibilities. My uh, personal um, strategy was always when we had guests from Japan and we tried very often to invite Japanese endoscopists, we um, invited also good friends from especially um, from, from Russia or for the, from the ex-Soviet Union area. And um, I think that was very important for us to create this network. And we still today profit from uh, this network on, and from the experience of uh, each of our friends. Yeah. Yeah. One, um, one last comment, if I'm allowed, is that, the, of course, we, we, we have now uh, the curricula that was established and locally, uh, I think each of the university centers or each of the leaders and also, of course, uh, and importantly, the national societies should implement these techniques. But I think after these decades of implementation and pioneering, um, we should properly select the patients. So it should be more and more focused on the patients. And of course, there are organs where it's mandatory to expose the patients to these, the rectum and the esophagus and also the stomach. And it's, it may be more questionable in other, in other areas. But uh, I, I, think we are, I think we are following the lead from the Eastern countries. Um, I don't know if any of our uh, leaders wants to intervene at this stage. Um, Otherwise, I would uh, thank you, Stefan, and we will continue to the to the next speech that. Uh